Hey, what is going on everybody and welcome to Fantasia for today. We're going to be jumping into another session of Epic 7L today. Got some more patch notes for you guys. This time we're going to be taking a look at the balance adjustment preview and I'm sure most of you guys watching this have already seen uh, the actual patch notes itself. I will be going through it. I have read them uh, this morning before I went to work, um, but I'm going to give you my opinion on everything and just to kind of give you my perspective um, uh, of all the changes that are going on. Now, before I jump into this, I do want to say that the balance adjustment previews um, and and all the patches that have really come out recently, uh, ever since the Awakened Potential update, I feel, have been very lackluster. And I think a lot of people in the community have been voicing their opinions about that. And the thing is, I think that... A well, first of all, from a game design perspective, uh, from a developer standpoint, it takes a long time to create a patch, especially something as big as the Awakened Potential update. And because they canceled that, uh, listening to the community feedback, thankfully they did, uh, we're now starting to see the side effects of it where they had things planned uh, in regards to that update being released and now they have to scramble and that might actually explain their delay in this uh, balance patch preview coming out a few days later. Uh, they kind of have to scramble to put things together because game developers actually plan out their game and the development uh, way far in advance. It's also probably one of the reasons why the last Epic patch that we got was a background instead of a character skin. I don't think they anticipated, uh, you know, having um, an epic pass there at that time, perhaps. And uh, they're just running just completely off of uh, whatever ideas they can come up with to fill in the gaps. So this balance patch, in my opinion, is probably part of that. It's just a little surprising to me because in the Awakened Potential update, they were talking about Crow, Ravi, Alencia, and Closer Charles, and we haven't seen anything about them uh, in these balance uh, adjustments. So I don't know, it's quite strange. Um, but yeah, with that out of the way, let's go ahead and actually jump into this and so I can give you my opinion on everything that's happening. Uh, the balance adjustment here, we have 11 heroes and 3 artifacts. So Judge Kisei, Spez, uh, Spirit Iseline, Hua Young, which is actually going to be very interesting to look at, Elena, Command Model Leica, Oxlots, Infinite Horizon Akades, Roman, and they cheat a little bit. Technically, a specially changed hero is considered 2 heroes, the original and their specially changed version, but Momo's here, which is kind of cool. Um, next up, we have Circus Fantasia, Manic of Control, and Sacred Tree Branch as the artifacts that are also getting a little tweak. So let's start off with uh, who I think is probably uh, the most interesting of the bunch. Uh, it's going to be Judge Kisei. So Judge Kisei is now going to go back towards being a cleave unit instead of a kind of opener um, control unit, I, I guess. Uh, so Judge Kisei's S1 is actually changed to penetrate target's defense by 20%. It's actually a pretty good change just for some more damage. The 50% chance to decrease defense for two turns implies that she's setting up for somebody else, but this actually just makes so she becomes the damage dealer and you can actually enhance the skill as well to get more damage dealt instead of having some effect chance uh, to go along with that defense break. For her next skill here, uh, the S2 is attacking all enemies with a sight, dispelling all buffs for a 100% chance to make them unable to counterattack for two turns, and you get a 75% chance to decrease defense for two turns. So they increase the cooldown on this skill, okay? But they did actually switch the Soul Burn to the S2 to gain an extra turn, uh, so that's going to be quite nice. Um, the thing with this is that you're looking at this and you might be like, oh, well, that's actually pretty cool in a vacuum. You know, cleavers get uh, a unit that can kind of do this. But this is really reminiscent of Knockwall, right? Uh, Knockwall can get the defense break with her own artifact. It's a lower percent chance, yes. Um, but she does dispel all buffs as well. And she can soul burn to ignore res. And there's also the chance to make them... Um, well, there's also... You, you put the bind on your opponent, right? The bind debuff, which means they can't counterattack. They also can't extra attack or dual attack or do anything else, proc anything else outside of their turn. So this just prevents counterattacks for two turns. It's pretty cool to see that this is actually going to be a uh, debuff now. Right, the unable to be counterattacked for two turns is going to be a debuff. So this might actually be important for setting up in the future, where you see units that get uh, released that have this as a debuff in their kit. Right, I don't think they're going to make this exclusive to Judge Kisei. It might be for a little bit, but I'm, I'm sure somebody else will get this down the line, uh, which is pretty cool to see. Uh, now moving on here to her S3, actually. 
so she no longer strips on the S3, uh, she strips on the S2, as you could tell from earlier. We're going to go to um, After the Awakening, because that's the important part. Uh, after the Awakening, we see that uh, her cooldown is actually reduced on this, those four turns, but you get to decrease, or sorry, increase school skill cooldowns by one turn uh, and you get invincibility to cast her for a turn so this is setting her up for dealing a bunch of damage and then being protected so she can live to see another turn in most cases if you're cleaving and you don't uh, kill your opponent your units just die right so this is kind of nice for um for uh, like aggro cleave teams that want an, an aoe damage dealer it's kind of a neutral dps right like an ml uh, you don't want to rely on rgbs necessarily because your opponent can counter pick you in terms of element and you deal 30 percent less damage in rta because of frenzy um but yeah here we see the increased cooldowns but one turn i feel like they're kind of taking away what made her very interesting which that she could do um she can increase skill cooldowns three times, essentially. And now, given it was an 80% chance for each one, um, but yeah, it was it was kind of nice just to see if she could pop off and actually get all those resets. Now she's only confined to one reset, so again, she kind of resembles a knockwall, but a, an offensive version of her. Um, I think the change is actually not too bad. Uh, her imprint concentration now is going to be uh, with effectiveness, probably to just help her be easier to build. Um... Yeah, I feel like the attack, the damage necess isn't necessarily that important right here, right? Getting the effectiveness to actually get the full buff strip, because she's really relying on these debuffs right now, right? Uh, you want to get the full buff strip, you want that uh, un unable to be countered debuff, so you're definitely going to be building her, like, you might build um, a Cleave Politis or a Cleave Eta, like a modern day Cleave one, right? Where they have about 100 something effectiveness built into them. Uh, same with, like, Bryceria. Most Bryceria's nowadays are damage dealers, but they also have, like, a hundred effectiveness minimum uh, to help with debuffs and landing those important skills. Now you can still get 15 percented. It's gonna be a really, really sad day when you uh, use Judge Kisei and ammo can 15 percent, uh, and uh, you still get counterattacks. So. <laughs> That's still on the plate. All right, next up, we got Spez. Now, he only got one change right here. So, Spez used to have a built-in Elbrus Ritual Sword uh, in his kit. So, whenever somebody else is attacked, uh, he has a 20% chance to counterattack. They just changed it, and they gave him 50% evasion. Now, I don't really know how I feel about this. The evasion is kind of nice for helping him survive, and you can pair this with other artifacts that can help him stay alive. So you can get up to 70% evasion with some bonus damage, maybe an attack buff from Moonlight Dreamblade, right? You can use Shepherd of the Hollow and all those other evasion artifacts that Remnant Violet and other units use. But the interesting thing about Spez is that really he's the only unit besides Closer Charles that doesn't do anything when you attack him. Uh, if he dodges, right? Closer Charles was supposed to get a buff from the Awakened Potential update, so you can kind of rule him out there, like maybe they're going to do something with him. We'll never know. People in the, you know, alternative timeline might know, but not us here. Um, so yeah, technically Spez really is the only evasion unit, right? Even Assassin Cartuja pushes himself up if he uh, dodges, right? Rylet gains focus, aid in counterattacks. Uh, every other evasion unit has something uh, that they do. So it's really interesting they just gave him evasion and they just kind of stopped. I would have liked it if they kind of gave him more. Uh, maybe, you know, gaining combat readiness every time uh, a unit is attack that's stunned, right? Something like that for, for like a, a allies that, that could help him out. So if an ally stuns somebody, he gets some combat readiness, he gets to push up and take the turn. Kind of like uh, Arunka, right? Anytime someone uh, that has a barrier takes a turn, she gains combat readiness. Maybe every time someone uh, is stunned on the opponent's side, you can get combat readiness, right? For the number of people that are stunned, right? If you stun four people with Solitaria, boom, Spez gets another turn, right? 25% combat readiness for every stunned unit. I don't know. It, it would be cool. Um, but yeah, we're stuck with just evasion for now. So we'll see. We'll see. My spez is built fairly tanky. I think most spezes are. But uh, getting losing out this chance to, to attack here mm, kind of hurts a little bit, I'd say. Not that he procced it very often, from my experience. Um, he has the same chance to counterattack as Shu, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Spez just never really did. All right. It's kind of disappointing. I really wanted to see him, like, get his time in the spotlight, but oh well. Moving on here, Spirit Eye Selene. Uh, we see that she loses the defense pen by 25%. It's increased to 
50%, which is kind of nice. And the uh, lifesteal part of her kit here is actually moved to her S1, the actual attack. So it's going to be gone from the uh, S3 here, right? Now, the S3 does get a little tweak. She actually uh, increases her attack by 25%, um, which is really interesting. So... The S1's damage is actually reduced. We'll have to see the numbers and the multipliers to see um, how this will play out. I think this might be good for Spirit Eye Selene if the multiplier isn't nerfed by a whole ton because she'll get the 25% extra attack. She penetrates defense by 15% uh, more, which is actually pretty substantial, right? Think about how much a pen set allows you to penetrate defense, right? So it's like getting additional penetration on top of that. Really, really good. Um... I think she'll end up dealing more damage than she did before. I know a lot of people have been saying like they want to switch their Selene's from lifesteal to speed set, that she didn't have enough lifesteal amount uh, from using speed set. I can't really attest to that because mine's on lifesteal. But yeah, any any change to Spirit Eye Selene like this to just help her increase damage output, I welcome. Even though I loosen them all the time in RTA apparently, but... <laughs> It is what it is, all right? I think Spirit Eye Selene is going to be one of the winners of this buff, too, if the multipliers are good. But again, we have to wait and see through testing. Now, speaking of waiting and seeing through testing, Hua Young is back in the picture. That's right. Uh, we do have to wait and see, though, because she is getting... Look at this. She's essentially getting fully reworked here in terms of uh, her kit. So the S1, she used to deal... Um, additional damage whenever she attacks and she's buffed but now anytime it's a successful attack uh she will deal that additional damage and you can actually soul burn this to increase the additional damage that's dealt and they also buffed it as well so she's going to be really good for just splash damage and i think she might actually be pretty nice into units like uh, mina galilius perhaps don't know but if that splash damage is pretty significant and you can run her on things like Iberius's tooth you might have quite a nice little unit to chunk away at your opponent consistently, right? Kind of like Karina with Rocket Punch Gauntlet, but this is in an RGB unit and it's built into her kit. Um, next up, she is losing this innate 30% attack and a lot of people are up in arms about it. However, I do want to say, uh, say that she does gain this attack buff. This makes her, now while people will say like, you know, you run her with an attack buffer anyway, and that is true. In most cases, you'd want to run her with an attack buffer. This makes her a lot more self-sufficient. Now, not saying that this is going to be overall good for her damage, that she can just one-shot knights. We're going to have to test that damage and see. Um, but she does lose that barrier as well. Now, this all comes together uh, here. So she does get that... Um, she still has her decreased critical hit damage received, right, by 30%, which is kind of nice protection that's built into her kit. Um, but you're going to see down here, right, for her S3, she still grants the immunity to herself. Oh, sorry, we should go to the Awakened one. Uh, so she'll dispel everything, right, dispel a buff from the caster, and she'll attack and grant immunity and a barrier to herself for two turns. So she still gets the barrier, just not every single turn like uh, in her passive before. Now, whenever her attack is greater than the target's attack, you can penetrate the defense up to a maximum of 100%. So she's meant to attack things like soul weavers, things like support units, and things like tanks, right? Knights that absorb damage. So she's meant to nuke those units because they tend to not have any attack built, uh, and you're hoping that your attack is going to be significant significantly higher. Now, we don't know the uh, the rate at which this occurs, right? We don't know how much more attack you need, um, and it, right, so we're going to have to see the testing. Uh, the barrier strength here is proportional to attack, which is kind of cool. So essentially what they did is they made her, instead of calculate depending on the difference between HP, I know a lot of people running torrent set, triple torrent Hua Youngs, right? People weren't even uh, leveling up helmets uh, to keep her HP low so that she could nuke uh, like anybody, essentially. Uh, what has changed to now is it's mainly just an attack difference. So you can build a bulky bruisery Hua Young that can be pretty difficult to kill because she still has some of that protection built into her. Again, she has that 30% decreased critical hit damage, right? I know she loses that innate 30% attack, so people are worried that the, um, 
that the uh the damage is not gonna be enough but again we're just gonna have to see the cooldown was reduced and her damage dealt is reduced as well on the s3 so part of me is thinking that she might not necessarily be used to one shot uh, something right off the bat anymore. Perhaps you still can if the attack difference is big enough. We have this is really important. You have to see uh, how this attack scaling works, right? Um, if it's not enough damage and that thirty percent passive attack was needed, that's going to be tricky to see uh, if she actually sees use after this. But I'm glad to see that they're trying to rework her and put her back in to the game because she fell off hard nobody pretty much nobody used her unless they're cheesing in arena or guild wars or having some fun um with like triple torrent builds but yeah uh i would love to see her be viable and i think she actually does have a place if she does still deal significant damage to really tanky units right units that don't have a lot of attack it'd be kind of nice she'd be good against bruisers at the very least right if you don't one shot a tank right because we have enough units like midnight god lilius and stuff to do that uh if her new role now is not necessarily a tank buster but to have the potential to just nuke for a ton of damage and be like anti-bruiser that would also be kind of cool right it would also be kind of nice all right so let's move on here to elena so she actually got a really minor tweak actually the next few are all pretty minor so we'll go through them quickly uh elena actually gets her ee built into her kit so she just dispels one debuff from all allies before using her s3 which is kind of nice um that's the ee that i always use it's the best one essentially if you get unbuffable put on your team right by something like let's say a bihu or whatever i don't know blitica right <laughs> <laughs> if anyone's using her. So yeah, Unbuffable is a pretty common debuff. So if you use Elena and you S3, if you have that Unbuffable on, you can't get the invincibility. This just allows you to cleanse and, and get it anyways. Now they did tweak the EE to just dispel one additional debuff from all allies. So now you can cleanse two debuffs with her S3, which is nice. It makes her a really strong cleansing Soul Weaver, because not many Soul Weavers cleanse debuffs with an S1, and Elena does. Now this makes her S3 even better, because it cleanses two before she puts on the invincibility. It's really nice. Um, yeah, it doesn't cleanse everything, but by that point, if you're getting overwhelmed with debuffs, you might as well just soul burn Elena's S1, right? And that would probably cleanse most of it. Um, okay, moving on here. Uh, we got command model Leica. So she also got a little tweak in terms of her EE. Now, uh, people were using the increased sleep chance. Pretty much everyone's using the increased sleep chance on her S3. So they essentially just built that into her kit, and she now has a 100% chance each to decrease speed uh, for two turns and to put um, the opponent to sleep for two turns. Or sorry, for one turn, not two turns. Uh, and yeah, that's just built in now. It's pretty nice. But they changed the EE. So now she gets to decrease buff durations on the target by one turn when she's using Strike Order. Strike Order is her S2 skill. Um, and this is why it says this effect is applied before inflicting target. So it is kind of nice that you can open up with an S2. You can strip immunity, right? Because it decreases buff durations by one turn. So it's not like if they buff stack that you can't strip the immunity. It just decreases everything by one turn, so you can get rid of that immunity at the start of the match, along with any other buffs that there are, and put that target debuff on. Pretty cool. Um, yeah, this this S2 is not uh, <laughs> it's not on the S3, right? This this EE, people were thinking, oh, you know, you get to strip as well now. You get to strip everyone's uh, immunity at the start of the match, then decrease speed, and then put everyone to sleep. That's not how this is working for, for Leica. This is on her s2 but i think it's a pretty welcome change uh and you know i know people do use Leica from time to time she's a nice little pocket pick for very aggressive teams so this might actually help out quite a bit gives her a bit more utility right all right so moving on here uh we got a lots and this is probably the most controversial uh change in the entire update so Oxlots uh, used to be a, a unit, I say used to be as if this is already implemented, uh, Alots before this proposed patch, um, you could use him on Spirit's Breath and you can essentially cheese things with him because Spirit's Breath decreases the cooldown of your non-attack skills by one turn um, after you use a non-attack skill and it's a 100% chance if you max limit break it. So when you S2 you get that Spirit's Breath effect and you can S2 again the next turn because his cooldown was only two turns on his S2, right? The main thing here is people were um, people were kind of upset that the cooldown was changed from two turns to three turns, and 
they were now granted an extra turn on Soulburn. So here's the thing. Well, there's like pros and cons to both of this, right? Uh, the effectiveness gain is actually pretty good. So Oxloss basically was used as a, as a cleave enabler. You would use Oxloss, you build him really fast, you'd S2 somebody, push him to the front, a slow DPS unit that has no speed, and you just built them pure damage, right? Um, people used him with things like Ludwig and stuff back in the day. Uh, Judge Kisei was the classic one, right? But now he's getting more utility, so by getting this effectiveness buff now for the ally and for himself right here, because he increased it for himself for two turns, um, you're opening up a, a possibility of more debuffs or support units being able to benefit from Oxlots' S2, not just damage dealers, right? It is kind of nice that they, they changed this, because he didn't need an attack buff, and an attack buff never helped him to begin with. Um, but the 30% combat readiness, it's fine to lose it, because you can now Soulburn to grant an extra turn, so technically this is better. Uh, and he can hold his own book, too. Now, if you're holding book, you're not using Spirit's Breath, and in most cases, if you're going to PvP, you're not using Spirit's Breath. PvE is where Spirit's Breath was used. You get to keep turn cycling your Ox Lots in his S2. Um, so yeah, people mostly used it in things like Abyss. Even in things like, uh, you can use Oxlots in things like Expeditions, but the AI is wonky, they'll always go and use the S3 whenever possible, so that kind of inter uh, intercepts your S2 combo that you'd always be doing, right? You have to kind of manually use him for that Spirit's Breath. Um, but the, the reason why they had to increase this cooldown to three turns is mainly because otherwise you could probably run him on Spirit's Breath. If this was on a cooldown of two turns and they gave him the soul burn effect to grant an extra turn then essentially what you're able to do is you're able to soul burn his s2 and you can just push up two units to 100 combat readiness now i'm not saying that that's broken or anything right because you need another book holder if he's on spirit's breath but it is a possibility and maybe they were looking at that and saying no i don't think that that's that's good uh, especially because we have a lot of units on like ml ludwig that's released and who really benefits from these soul burn effects and everything perhaps it was too strong i don't know um i'm also not a really aggressive or cleave um player so therefore i can't really speak to this i'd love to know your thoughts in the comments below um like constructive thoughts obviously now he does actually set himself up though he gets this increase effectiveness right so you can build him with a little bit of effectiveness some bulk some speed right like the typical a lots you would normally have but uh, his s3 now uh attacks it's an aoe attack it dispels two buffs from the opponent and has a 75 percent chance of silence for two turns he's always had that uh it's just that he never uh stripped buffs before so now that you can dispel two buffs um it's gonna be interesting he is meant Meant to go S2, Solber in the S2, push somebody up, then he takes the extra turn, he'll dispel two buffs from them, silence for two turns, and essentially your the next unit gets to go, right? So a lots could technically set up for like a debuffer that doesn't have a strip built into their own kit, uh, or a lots could be um, setting up for like a cleave or an aggressive play, and if you silence uh, the units on the opponent's side for two turns, it's going to be really difficult for them to turn cycle out of it without units like Dilibet, for example, that can cleanse themselves. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. Um, I'm, I'm a little conflicted on it. I feel like they want him to be more of a PvP unit. People used him as PvP, then when he fell off, they swapped to using him in PvE, and now they're trying to switch him back to PvP-oriented uh, play with his kit, but people don't seem to like that. I don't know. I think statistics show that only about 20% of Oxlot's uh, builds out there use Spirit's Breath, and like almost 60% use uh, Book. So people are probably still using Oxlot's in aggressive teams. I know I, I see some videos here and there. I think like YDCB still uses his Oxlot's from time to time too. But yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see how this would affect the PvP side of things. I know people are upset about Spirit's Breath and PvE, but yeah. Uh, I think it might be a good change. The only thing I would say is that he doesn't have really great base speed, so he can't necessarily be an opener, which is kind of what this S2, S3 combo is hinting at. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of difficult to judge, but I'll leave that up to you guys in the comments. Uh, let me know what you think. This is the most controversial one here. Next up, Infinite Horizon Acades. Uh, she got a really minor tweak. She now only get she gets a 20% combat readiness instead of 15%. 
So I, I hear mixed opinions on this. Some people say that a case is really annoying because the combat readiness cuts when like too early before the opponent's main debuffers go, and you are now too far behind to, to cut and uh, cleanse your whole team and, and get her effect off. The other side of things is that uh, people are saying just the combat readiness is just kind of hard to time, right? You 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 might cut too early, you might cut too late. I think this 20% increase is kind of trying to make things the best of both worlds, right? If your opponent's units are going and, and uh, you get to increase Comoranius by more, if Akadis accidentally went before the debuffer, right, the main debuffer that was going to go, then she can turn cycle back quicker. But then there's the argument of this actually makes it so she might cut the debuffer earlier. I, I don't know. Most people build Akadis pretty slow anyway to compensate for the combat readiness increases, but I think it's a pretty decent little change. Any little tweak um, is good. I was, I was kind of hoping that they would um, just give me a copy of her. That'd be kind of great. <laughs> so I don't have her, so I'd really love to use her. Uh, I just don't have full concrete opinions on this. I'm just uh, relaying what I know based on the community and based on what I've seen. I would love a copy, Smilegate, so if you can give her to me and the next time we do Galaxy Summons, that'd be fantastic, so I can test this out for myself. All right, next up, we got Roman. Uh, Roman here is um, getting an interesting change. He just loses this damage dealt increase when the enemy is buffed, which honestly doesn't really matter because he's not a damage dealer, and now he just gets to inflict Restrict for two turns. Um... And yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much uh, that's pretty much it. <laughs> now he does lose actually. So whenever the enemy is inflicted by, um, sorry, when when the enemy is buffed, right, his damage dealt was increased, and the enemy is inflicted with two points of extra two turns, then he would increase his combat readiness by thirty percent. So he, yeah, I don't know. He's losing uh, quite a bit. They actually didn't really highlight all the changes here because uh it says here that they're you still dispel all buffs right oh no hang on never mind they, they put it back here the, the combat readiness is still there he just doesn't get that extra 30 percent which i mean they could have probably kept that i don't know why they took it away uh, i don't know if like restrict and then pushing them back and then they can't push themselves up is too strong um restrict now is really nice after the previous couple balance patches ago um you can push people back when they have restrict they just can't push themselves forward right so kind of helping out debuffers here in a sense uh, Roman is a good pocket pick. Some people were using him a couple seasons ago in like Emperor and Legend, so I do know that he is viable. Um, so this change I think is pretty decent. It's pretty decent for him. It's just a minor one since not many people are using Roman. Uh, people are speculating that uh, Roman buff and the Momo buff right here are actually for the next rift, which could be an ice rift, and uh, that Momo might be the ideal tank for that, just like Hazel was the ideal tank for this current one, the fire one. So Momo here essentially got a extra chance to sleep, doesn't really affect PvE content, which is mostly where she's used in, uh, but I have used Momo in PvP. In fact, I think last year's New Year's video was me using Momo uh, in RTA, and she did really good as a pocket pick, right, against uh, super heavy debuff comps, because uh, her turn cycling is insane. Now, the uh, this rune here, uh, when she's attacked by an enemy that's not an elite or boss monster, it decreases damage suffered by 20%, so yeah, I don't know. Uh, th this is not something that helps her tank bosses or anything, like PvE content. People are just speculating that she might be useful in, in Rift. Uh, she is a good healer in PvE in general. But yeah, so she gets more survivability. I don't know. This It's kind of interesting to see. I'm all for it, because uh, Momo is actually a really good Soul Weaver. Uh, people just kind of underestimate her because she's a 3-star. But especially change Momo, pretty good. Uh, especially with this debuff-heavy uh, meta. I might actually rebuild mine uh, to combat things like DDR. But that requires a bit of testing to see if it's viable. All right, moving on here. Uh, we got some artifact changes. So last few things, we'll knock these out real quick. Uh, Circus Fantasia, you just get a flat critical hit chance increase, which is all right. It's kind of welcome. Uh, nothing bad to say about that, really. Uh, next up, Manic of Control. This is actually kind of a side grade. I wouldn't say it's a full upgrade. So the original wording of this is that you increase hit chance by 10 to 20% and critical hit chance by 15% when you do a single target attack. 
okay? And it's different than just blanketly increasing critical hit chance by 15%. The reason why is Smallgate made a post explaining how critical uh, hit chance works and critical hit resist works. If you have an effect that gains critical hit chance when you do something, you can go over a cap, right? You can go over the cap of like 100%. Uh, if you have a straight up buff, uh, like, a, like a visible buff, like a critical hit chance buff, or you have something like an artifact that just increases it by a flat amount, this cannot over cap. So people were saying like, oh, this is going to suck because you can't get the extra 15% crit that you can use to hit like Navy Captain Landy, for example. But honestly, no one was using Manic of Control anyway, so I don't think anyone was using Manic of Control as a special tech against ML Landy. Um, this is actually just a good increase. Now, I would have liked them to just change this as well, where you get the extra hit chance on any attack. I don't know if that would have been too good for thieves. Uh, I don't know if there's any thieves out there that could have really abused this extra hit chance. Like, they could have just put him on Symbol of Unity anyway. But a DPS unit to get some critical hit chance to cap, and uh, you can get some extra hit chance you know would have been nice but it's still a little restrictive with a single target attack it's okay though i think it's still fine um this might be good for something like winter if you're trying to use winter and your opponent's picking ice units and stuff could be okay because the crit hit chance is actually good for her too then again probably could have used it in its original form too i don't know uh, it's, it's a really minor tweak next up sacred tree branch uh this is sharoon's artifact so uh, the only thing that really changes, instead of attacking with S1, a basic skill, now it's any time after you attack, you increase combat readiness of the caster and the ally, except for the caster with the highest attack by 10%. Uh, it's actually decent, I would say. It actually helps uh, synergize a bit more with Sharoon's actual kit. So, we'll see. Maybe this is actually going to be pretty good for um, the Dragonlord Sharoon that's going to be coming out. ML Sharoon, right? Uh, we'll see, we'll see. This will make this uh, artifact a bit more... A bit more um, versatile, right? You don't have to S1. Because otherwise it's a dead artifact unless you're S1-ing. And most Soul Weaver's S1s are pretty weak. They're usually just heal somebody or apply a, a debuff like Sleep or Stun. All right, but I think that is pretty much it for the Balance Adjustment Preview. Let me know who you guys think is the biggest winner of this patch and who you think is the biggest loser. Uh, I think, in my opinion, the biggest winner for this patch is probably going to be... Like, it seems really sleeper, but it's gonna be Spirit Eye Selene, right? She has a bunch of tweaks, and she she seems like she's gonna be, hopefully, just overall better damage dealer. I think Hua Yong also has the potential to kind of steal this, right? Be like the dark horse of this uh, update, and actually just come back into the meta full force, and the uh, players might welcome her with, uh, with open arms. <laughs> but with that being said, though, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I really do appreciate it. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like and subscribe for more Epic 7 content. And until next time... Take care.